One of the tools that we have for keeping track of subatomic particles is the quantity called oxidation number. Oxidation numbers are related to charge and they're a similar idea, but oxidation numbers have the advantage of letting us look at how electrons are distributed in a molecule or a polyatomic ion rather than just on an element or, an, or a monoatomic ion. They can be really helpful when we're trying to look at structure and uh, stability of structures and predict react reactivity and other properties in chemical reactions. There are a couple different ways to determine oxidation numbers. Uh, this video is going to go through a rules-based way, so let's get to the rules. First of all, just something to keep in the back of your mind, oxidation numbers treat all electrons as if all bonds are purely ionic. So this is just a way for us to visualize electrons. It doesn't mean that these bonds are ionic, but we're figuring out oxidation numbers as if the bonds were purely ionic. Here are the rules. I'm just going to go through them quick and then we'll touch on each one. For neutral uncombined elements, the oxidation number is zero. For monoatomic ions, the oxidation number is equal to the charge. So in those two cases, oxidation number and charge really are behaving like the same thing. Rule number three is where things diverge a little bit. So for polyatomic ions, molecules, or formulas, the sum of the oxidation numbers must equal the total charge on the polyatomic ion molecule or formula. So what this is really getting at is for polyatomics of any sort, charge is a characteristic of the entire assembly of atoms in that polyatomic. Oxidation number looks at each individual atom in that grouping. And then four and five are just some uh, typical cases, except when they're combined with other elements, oxygen is almost always minus two except for peroxides, and hydrogen is almost always plus one except for hydrides. Let's take a look at some examples uh, and work through the rules to, to see those. Rule number one, this is elements. For uncombined neutral elements, the oxidation number is zero. So it doesn't matter what the element is, it doesn't matter if it's a metal, it, it doesn't matter if it's a diatomic element like nitrogen or chlorine or hydrogen. All that matters is that for these uncombined neutral elements, the oxidation number is zero. So that's just like charge. Rule number two, for monoatomic ions, the oxidation number is equal to the charge. So once again, all of these we can look at very quickly and say, well, the oxidation number is plus one, oxidation number is plus five, oxidation number is minus three on all of these. So those are the cases that are a little bit uh, more familiar to us having worked with charge. Then we get to the polyatomics. So for any polyatomic grouping, the sum of the oxidation numbers on all the atoms in that grouping must equal the charge on the polyatomic grouping. So here we've got HNO3. So the charge of this is zero, it's neutral. The oxidation number of hydrogen, nitrogen and three oxygens has to add up to zero because it's a neutral molecule. Now, how are we gonna do that? We got a lot of variables here. Let's take a quick little jump ahead and look at rule four and five. And rules four and five aren't really rules. I mean, they're, they're tendencies, they're observations. Hydrogen is almost always plus one. Oxygen is almost always plus two. So those are just useful things. If you've got a structure, if you've got a big formula and you have to make a guess, guess that hydrogen is plus one, unless it's uh, H2 molecule. Guess that oxygen is negative two, unless it's an O2 molecule. Those other explicit exceptions uh, come about in some special cases. Hydrogen is usually plus one, but when it's reacted with a metal, when it's bound to a metal, most metal ions are much more likely to have positive oxidation numbers. So something has to have a negative oxidation number and hydrogen, it turns out, can uh, take on a negative oxidation number. So because it's so small, it can only take on one extra electron to make a hydride with an oxidation number of minus one. Similarly with oxygen, if an oxygen molecule reacts but doesn't react so that it completely breaks apart this O2 unit, 
Um, we get sort of an intermediate structure that's halfway between an O2 molecule, which would have an oxidation number of zero, and a typical oxygen, which would have an oxidation number of minus two. We get to a peroxide with an oxidation number of minus one. Okay, back to those polyatomics. Now we've got some more tools to help us out. Nitric acid, HNO3. H is usually plus one, so let's say that that hydrogen has got an oxidation number of plus one. Oxygen is usually minus two, so let's say that that's got an oxidation number of minus two. What about nitrogen? Well, this is where that sum of the oxidation numbers comes in. So the sum of all these oxidation numbers, one of hydrogen's oxidation number plus one nitrogen oxidation number plus three oxygen oxidation numbers has to equal zero because this is a neutral formula. Plugging in those numbers, work my way down, and in this case it looks like the oxidation number of nitrogen in HNO3 is plus five. So that's really how we use rule three to get us oxidation numbers. We usually have to assume that hydrogen is plus one and oxygen is minus two because those show up in a lot of different molecules. But usually we only have one unknown left and we can use this process to figure out its oxidation number. Oxidation numbers require so much practice. So get out there, grab a bunch of chemical formulas and figure out oxidation numbers on all the components. One really, really useful group of things to look at oxidation numbers on is the polyatomic ions. It gives you practice with oxidation numbers as well as giving you a little bit of practice with remembering those polyatomic ions. So good luck and get practicing.